So w welcome back, uh, those of you that are back again. Good to see you all, and I'm happy to be back. Uh, I'll be back uh, one more time for this series on Wednesday, and then uh, I'm sure there'll be something else coming up somewhere down the road. I just I was letting Jessica know that uh, this morning I actually did a presentation uh, at Marquette University High School. Uh, one of the guys was a part of the program that the museum did this summer uh, invited me to come and speak to his students, summer school students. Uh, and I talked about the history of the Confederate flag. So that was uh, kind of cool. But we are here to talk about Do Black Lives Matter? And so this is a four-part series. This is part number three for Racine. I'll be doing this again. Um, next month in Milwaukee uh, and like I said I'll be back here again uh, on Wednesday to do the fourth part of this presentation so we've done the first two parts the first part kind of was an overall big kind of big picture uh, look at the problem uh, and then the last time who can tell me what I talked about the last time we've talked about some of the laws and and issues that were related to the devaluation of black lives. So we looked at court cases, we looked at uh, slave codes, we looked at a variety of different laws. Um, and, and so- Can you introduce yourself one more time for the video? Oh, sure. I'm Reggie Jackson, the chairman of the Dr. James Campbell Legacy of Our Nation. That's the umbrella organization that runs America's Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee and our virtual museum, which is at abhmuseum.org. We've been online for three and a half years. We've been visited by over 200 countries. Mm -hmm. And we have had on average about 500,000 visitors per year. Uh, and we're working to increase that. But it's been very, very successful so far. Uh, and so I decided to do this program. Uh, tonight's program is looking at scientific and medical devaluation of black lives in American history. And so we'll look at uh, some instances of blacks being used as experimental tools um, by medical schools and doctors. We'll look at some of the medical experiments that took place. Um, we'll look at some of the pseudoscience, very, very small piece of the pseudoscience used to justify blacks as inferior beings to justify slavery. And we'll look at the role played uh, by a psychological giant such as Jung and Freud in the devaluation of black lives. So we're gonna be looking at quite a few things tonight. Uh, and like I said, the last time I was here, a few words on words. Some people prefer African American. To me, that's just too much to say. I just like the term black. That's what I prefer to use, but I bounce back and forth. And I typically use the term enslaved African instead of slave because to me a slave is just an object and I want to rehumanize those people by calling them uh, what they were, which were uh, human beings. And so unless I'm using that term from a, a specific document or law, then I typically will use enslaved African. Okay, so my Q&A procedure is always the same. Uh, I have some index cards on the table in the back. If during the course of the presentation you think of a question that you want to ask, just write it down on the card and at the end of the presentation I'll collect those cards and do the best I can to answer those questions that you may have. All right. I have decided to do this series as a result of the movement that's known as Black Lives Matter, which started as a result of the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri last year. And so there's been a lot of conversation nationally, a lot of conversation in Milwaukee where I live about it, and I've been listening to a lot of this dialogue back and forth. A lot of you know great things have been said, a lot of very interesting things talked about, but one of the things that I found that was lacking was a historical context for this conversation. You know, it, it's, it's like I, I said uh, when I was here last week. It, it seems kind of like a no-brainer to say black lives matter. Of course black lives matter. But then if you look at our country's history, you have to ask a question instead of making a statement. <laughs> and you have to say, do black lives matter? And so what I decided to do was to investigate this put together these four presentations and then share this information that I've gathered with you all. Uh, I did provide tonight a resource list of not all, but a lot of the resources that I use to do these four presentations, including the one that will be coming up on Wednesday. Uh, there are some other resources. I use some websites, 
some videos that I have at home, some YouTube videos. I didn't want to put all of that on there. I just put a list of some of the books. If you guys are interested in the books, I'm sure that you guys could probably get them through the library. I have to warn you though, most of the books that I read are kind of academic based books and they're not the type of books that you just sit down and say, I'm going to read this for the joy of it. I do, because I enjoy all of this stuff. But a lot of the books, I tell you, it's like a giant sleeping pill that's 487 pages. So some of those books will be kind of difficult for you to read. Uh, in particular, I, I can tell you one that I can guarantee you guarantee you will put you to sleep. Uh, the one about Dred Scott, it's about um. 600 pages. And oh my goodness, it's a great book, but oh my goodness, it's very difficult to read. Um, another one, Arguing About Slavery. If you want to listen to politicians argue about slavery, imagine how interesting that must have been back in the 1700s, 1800s. That's another one that I can guarantee you is a great book, but it will put you to sleep very, very quickly. But all of those are great resources. And there's some additional ones uh, that Betty talked to me about that I didn't use for the presentation, uh, but I'll let her share those with you. Betty, you want to mention the books that you mentioned earlier? Oh, the post-traumatic slave syndrome, and the uh, written by a very uh, perceptive black mom, and she quotes her son's reactions to different things. Very. I learned a lot from that. Also, the ebony and ivory, and that shows how our elite uh, institutions of higher learning are built on the slave trade. Um, inheriting the trade by Tom DeWolf, whose ancestors were the chief uh, slave traders. A welcome to the, or invitation to the table. I forget the exact title, but again, talking about what they're doing uh, to increase the, the personal experience of a black woman and a white man. Very interesting. Um, redoing the trip on the, going to Africa, going to the Caribbean, and then back <coughs> to uh, Rhode Island. And um, of course, waking up white. Thank you, Betty. So those are some other resources that are available, uh, all great books. I've read each one of those except for Ebony and Ivory. Uh, and actually, Tom DeWolf uh, was a, did a presentation uh, at our Founders Day program uh, uh, two years ago. And it was a wonderful, wonderful program. So mm -hmm. let's move on. Uh, this was uh, something that I read that Dr. King said uh, many, many years ago after the Selma March after the Selma March, he talked about uh, inequality within the, the health system. And he said it is the most shocking and the most inhumane form of injustice. So we're gonna look at how black lives were devalued by using them as experimental tools to test a variety of different treatments, a variety of different types of surgery to see whether or not they worked. And if we perfected them, then okay, we would continue to use them uh, and we would be feel, we'd feel safe to use them on whites. So, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this picture. This is actually a picture of one of the members who was um, a participant in the Tuskegee syphilis study, which we'll talk about. Uh, and this is one of the people that was giving him treatment, or so he thought. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. So uh, one of the resources that I wanted to share with you guys, because I think this is absolutely tremendous, I, I quote from extensively uh, during this presentation, is this wonderful book by uh, Harriet Washington, Medical Apartheid. And in this quote uh, from the beginning of the book, I think just really says everything you need to know about uh, this process. So she talked about the blacks who were used as subjects were given experimental vaccines known to have unacceptably high lethality, were enrolled in experiments without their consent or knowledge, were subjected to surreptitious surgical and medical procedures while unconscious, injected with toxic substances, deliberately monitored rather than treated for daily ailments, excluded from life-saving treatments, or secretly farmed for serum or tissues that were used to perfect technology such as infectious disease tests. So we'll talk about a lot of those, not all of them. Get the book. 
because I can't talk about everything in the book. It's just way too much. But it's some wonderful stuff from the book. Uh, and I'll also be showing you guys uh, some interviews uh, that she did, um, I believe, two years ago. Uh, so you guys will see her in a couple videos. All right, slaves as research subjects. Enslaved Africans had no protections from anybody who wanted to use them in these experiments. They were just, you know, they were property. They didn't have a voice in anything that happened in their lives. So anytime somebody wanted to use them for this purpose, they would simply use them. And in some cases, the people that were their owners uh, would do it if the owner was a doctor. Sometimes their owners would rent them out or even sell them to medical professionals or hospitals. And they really had no recourse. They were in a situation where they had no voice, no protection. And so they basically were stuck dealing with these things that happened to them. So let's look at what medical care looked like in the 18th century. We make this assumption, and it's always funny to me, at, at every given point in time, the experts are wrong. And we don't find out till 20 years later, 50 years later, 100 years later. But at the time, they know exactly what they're talking about. They can't possibly be wrong. So let's look at some of the things that were part of medical care in the 18th century. And it's really kind of bizarre when you think of some of these things. Bloodletting was a very common procedure. In fact, uh, President George Washington was basically killed because he did bloodletting for him shortly before he died. Massive amounts of blood was taken from his body. They used to force people to vomit because they felt that you could vomit diseases out of your body that way. Uh, violent diarrhea, they would give you different chemicals to drink to make you have this violent diarrhea to flush uh, bugs out of your system. There was no such thing as infection. They didn't understand infection and that these little bugs would be everywhere unless you kept the place sanitized, kept your hands nice and clean. So there's no such thing as, as a, a, a place where you did these experiments that was a clean place. Oftentimes the experiments that were done on the blacks were done right in the slave quarters. And the slave quarters are oftentimes built right next to the, to the stable where the horses were. So obviously the conditions were just absolutely terrible. Very unsanitary. Toxic chemicals like mercury, arsenic, calomel were commonly used in these procedures, and anesthesia had not been developed at all. Uh, opium, cocaine, morphine were commonly used uh, in these procedures. So it, it was quite a bit different from what, it, what it's like today. So you can see that as a result of that, these things didn't necessarily go over very well. So let's look at the impacts of some of the medicines. What did some of the medicines uh, do to people that they used? Uh, people oftentimes became addicted, became very sick, or died from the medication. So you give a medication and the medication kills you. Uh, you would get deadly lung diseases uh, were very common. Medicines that compromised your immune system and made you susceptible to even more ailments. Uh, medicines would cause very serious heart conditions and oftentimes they led to people getting cancers that they died from later. So it, it was kind of not a great time to be sick back at this particular time in history. So they were used as guinea pigs. Some of the things that people did to them was they used them to, wait, let me go back. They used these people to test different medications, test different treatments. So they were, why is this happening? I don't understand. Hold on, I know how to fix it. Okay, so slave owners treated the sick before calling doctors. Slave owners determined who needed medical treatment. They rented Africans out to physicians and medical schools, and they regularly accused them of faking sickness. You're just pretending you're sick. You're 85 years old, but you're not really sick. You can still work. And so they said that they pretended to be sick. Uh, in addition to that, they would punish them for being sick because they felt that they were faking it. So the doctors were oftentimes, his recommendation, if they were pretending to be sick, well, just whip them and they'll, they'll stop pretending to be sick. Or they would use very strong smelling salts to wake people up to check to see if they were truly sick. And one doctor recommended that an owner apply nine drops of essence of rawhide or oil of hickory to the back of a sick slave to get him out of this pretend ailment that he was dealing with. And so it wasn't a very good time to be sick because even if you were sick, oftentimes they didn't believe that you were. 
You guys have probably never seen this word before. But it's a fear of doctors, basically. Iotrophobia. A fear of going to the doctor. It's very common among black people in America now. This fear and loathing that blacks harbor towards the medical profession. Based on history. Not based on, well, you know, something stupid. It's based on stories that we've heard that have been passed down in our families. Stories that we've heard. There are so many people that have heard about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Uh, and I, I very rarely run into people that haven't heard of that. And so there's this, this innate fear that blacks have uh, of the medical establishment based on the history that we've had with that system. Uh, scientific racism was developed in the 1800s and it was designed to describe blacks in a particular way. Uh, they called blacks inherently debased, inferior to whites, liars, lazy, hypersexual, beast-like, with different physical structures than whites, including smaller brains and different skeletons. And it led to a belief that there were black-only diseases or diseases that if blacks and whites got them, they acted completely different inside of their bodies. And so this was kind of the mindset of the medical profession at that time during the, the, the latter part of enslavement of Africans in the country. Samuel Cartwright was one of the giants uh, of medicine in the United States at this particular time. And he wrote this very interesting book about something that he made up. <laughs> he claimed that there was a disease that caused slaves to want to run away. And he called it drapetomania. And so he also published another important report called Report on the Diseases and Physical Pe Peculiarities of the Negro Race, where he basically talked about these black-only diseases in this book. But if you look, there are a few other very strange, very crazy, hard to say words that were used to describe things about blacks in medicine. So one of them is drapetomania. So that was, according to Dr. Cartwright, a mental disorder which enslaved blacks, shared with cats. So cats had this too. And it was an, it, this insane desire to run away. And the cure was simply to whip the devil out of them. That's how you cured them from wanting to run away. You just whipped it out of them. So that was one of the, the so-called diseases that blacks had. Uh, diesthesia, I'm not even trying to say it because I'm going to mess it up. But this is another one. Dr. Cartwright talked about a mental disorder which freed blacks and some enslaved blacks had, which was characterized by a strong desire to destroy the property of white slaveholders. They specifically talked about a majority of people that had it were supposedly freed slaves. That the ones who were slaves had something different. They had a different disease, hebitude. And according, once again, to Dr. Cartwright, this is a mental disorder which enslaved blacks had described as laziness, shiftlessness, that caused them to mishandle and abuse their owner's property. Now, the black people knew that it wasn't a disease. It was simply a desire to not have to continue working your butt off from can't see to can't see, as they used to call it, for free. So why should I work hard? Why should I not damage the equipment I'm working with? Why should I da not damage myself? And so these are the things that, that blacks did instead of the, the white slave owners who wanted to support the system of enslavement saying, okay, that, that actually makes sense for slaves to do that. They said, no, they must be sick. They must have this mental illness. That's why they're doing what they're doing. So those are some of the diseases that they came up with to describe uh, basically what slaves should do. They shouldn't work hard. There's no reason they should work hard for someone else to make money. So we're going to look at medical experiments on enslaved Africans. And like I said, the, the book Medical Apartheid does a tremendous job talking about all of these things. One of the giants of, of medicine in American history is Dr. Sims. He is considered to be the father of gynecology. And this is a painting that was made of him about 100 years uh, after he was doing these experiments. And it showed this young black woman here about to be experimented on and his two assistants. He's standing here and a couple other black women are standing in the background. Now this makes it seem like this is the way it usually worked, but in reality, it didn't work this way. Uh, he made it his name by butchering the genitalia. Un un uh, my tongue is not working tonight. People that would have to go through these horrible experiences with no anesthesia. Imagine this, he's cutting on your body with no anesthesia, you're bloody, you're screaming, you're naked, and this is all in the name of medical advancement. And so he became famous for this, and we'll talk about him in a little more detail, but this photograph shows you the mythology 
of what was said about Dr. Sims. The reality was totally and completely different. James Williams Sims is a very important surgeon from Alabama. And his, all of his medical experimentation took place with slaves. Um, he took the skulls of young children, uh, young black children, only black children, and um, he opened their heads and moved around the bones of the skull to see what would happen. Positive as a cure for disease, but there was no rationale for that. He also decided to remove the jawbone of a slave, but this slave was pretty intractable. He did not want the surgery. He loudly protested against it, and in response, Dr. Sims had him tied to a barber's chair and held immobile while he operated on him without anesthesia. But he's most infamous for his experiments, uh, reproductive experiments with black women. He bought or otherwise acquired a group of black women who he housed in a laboratory. And over the period of five years and approximately 40 surgeries on one slave alone, he sought to cure a devastating complication of childbirth called vesicovaginal fistula. This cure entailed repeatedly um, sl um, doing incisions on their genitalia. Very painful and, you know, very emotionally difficult as you can imagine. And um, in the end, he claims to have cured one of them. And after this, he went north where his medical fortune was made. He went, he became the toast of Second Empire Paris when he went there to um, be the personal physician of Princess Eugenie. And when he returned to New York, he was elected the president of the American Medical Association. I think this is really important because although often we speak of surgeons and doctors who do non consensual experimentation and we think of these Frankensteinian characters. But the reality is these have tended to be overachieving adepts who were stellar physicians. They were well revered, well respected within the profession in their time. And only people people only knew of their work through their own bolderized versions of it. They wrote up these uh, accounts in medical journals, but they never characterized them as abusive experimentation because it was accepted for them that you operated on slaves who couldn't say no. So that's uh, Harry Washington on Democracy Now! talking about uh, Dr. Sims. There were a lot of, of males, females, children that were experimented on for a variety of different reasons. Uh, and even free blacks were used as you know, someone to do experiments on. It wasn't just the enslaved population. And so you have this abusive medical experimentation what was going on, and it was just business as usual. Standard operating procedures within the medical profession in America. It wasn't something that was out of the ordinary. This is just the way things were done at that particular time. So there were dual benefits for whites. These experiments offered procedures that had been perfected. By the time they used them on whites, they had done it enough times on blacks to get it right and then they said okay now it's safe to use on whites and in many cases when they were practicing them on on blacks they didn't use any anesthesia at all because they felt one of the myths about blacks was that well they didn't feel pain the same way whites felt pain and if they did feel pain it wasn't that big of a deal and so the other benefit for whites was white doctors gained notoriety fame and in some cases uh, like Dr. Sims, they gained a fortune as a result of these experiments that they had done. Uh, and so, let's look at a few examples of a couple experiments that uh, Ms. Washington talks about uh, in Medical Apartheid. Uh, Dr. James Dugas uh, pioneered an eye surgery. 80% uh, of the people that he tried this on were actually black people before he actually perfected it. Uh, beginning in 1830, there were 37 experimental cesarean sections performed by Dr. Prevost, and he used slaves in 30 of those 37 to perfect this technique, which he eventually did. The 1846 records of Dr. Jones of Virginia revealed that he experimented by pouring boiling water on naked enslaved typhoid pneumonia patients at four hour intervals. Uh, and so these are the types of things these people had to endure, very painful, uh, and, and some didn't really even make sense. Uh, but the people that were doing them felt that they made perfect sense and they continued doing them unabated for year after year. So these are some of the myths about blacks that the medical profession put out there. They believe that blacks naturally harbor diseases, that we were just naturally disease-ridden people. Uh, they also believe that they didn't feel pain or anxiety. Uh, in addition to that, 
this doctor, Dr. White declared that blacks bear surgical operations much better than white people, and what would be the cause of insupportable pain for white men, a Negro would almost disregard. I have amputated the legs of many Negroes who have held the upper part of the limb themselves. Without anesthesia, he's cutting somebody's limb off. And so he felt, well, you know, they're not really feeling that much pain. And so these are some of the myths that were spread about blacks to justify doing these experiments on them. Uh, in addition to that, another doctor, James Johnson, sneered, we come to reflect that all the women operated on in Kentucky except one were negresses, and that these people will bear anything with nearly if not quite as much impunity as dogs and rabbits, our wonder is lessened. So there's really no respect for the value of the lives of these black people whatsoever, as you guys can see in these few experiments that we talked about. But it gets worse. It actually gets worse. As we move forward, we look at the story of John Brown as one of the people that she talks about in the book. Uh, during the 1820s and 1830s, he was experimented on by Dr. Uh, Hamilton, Clinton, Georgia. And one of the things that he did, the first experiment he did on Mr. Brown was to place him in this fire pit that he dug in the ground. Uh, and he forced him to endure heat tests to test treatments for sunstroke. So he would put him in this hole and have combustible materials in there, very hot. He would cover it up completely, and the only thing that would be uncovered would be Mr. Brown's head. And so he would test to see the impact that it had on Mr. Brown's body. And obviously, with the heat, Mr. Brown passed out on a regular basis. But you know, he he was owned by this guy, so he didn't really have much choice. He had to endure this. So after a few days rest, he was subjected to a new set of experiments, uh, which was bled every every other day. So they're basically letting blood out of your body. Uh, but obviously, as he said, it was worse to come. It, he set to work on ascertaining how deep his black skin went. He wanted to see how deep that layer of skin that's black, how deep it was. And so he did experiments by applying blisters to his hands, feet, his legs, and he still bared those scars many, many years later. And he said that he used to blister me at intervals about two weeks. He also tried other experiments upon me, which I cannot dwell upon. So these other experiments were so horrific, so bad, that Mr. Brown, as he's telling this story for his uh, autobiography that someone wrote, it, these others are so horrific, he can't even come to say what they were. That's how horrible they were to him. Uh, so Dr. Sims, let's look at him in a little more detail. He's revered as the father of gynecology, even though he conducted years of painful and degrading experiments without anesthesia or consent on a group of enslaved women. And he oftentimes used black infants as subjects for experiments that he did as well. He acquired 17 uh, enslaved women whom he used in his experiments and his workers in his laboratory. So this is a disease that Harriet Washington talked about. And it's a disease that is very common, especially among young females who got pregnant. Their body was not ready for a pregnancy, and what happens is when they were having the baby, it actually tore, tore them up down, down in their private parts. And so it ripped their body apart in such a way that the open, they were opening between the remains of the vagina, bladder, and rectum due, for, due to this very difficult childbirth. And so as they had their natural body movements using the bathroom, these things would mix together and they would get infections and get very, very sick. It was very debilitating. Uh, he knew that curing it would make his medical fortune, and he also knew that using white women to test such painful surgeries was absolutely, positively impossible. It was not gonna happen. He was not gonna be able to test it on white women. There were quite a few white women who got this uh, complication as well. Uh, it was way more common back at that time. They said one of the things that contributed to it was a lack of vitamin D, uh, but also very young females having babies. So he decided to do these experiments to try to fix the problem. And he acquired a total of 11 women with this condition from their masters and conducted painful surgical treatments for the next four, four and a half, almost five years, he did these experiments to try to perfect his technique to fix this problem. So he made the women undress completely and then get down on their hands and knees while he and several physicians took turns inserting a special speculum that he had created himself to open the woman's vagina fully. And he says the first time he did this, he says, I saw everything as no man had seen before. Uh, he invited other physicians to 
to this laboratory. Oh, sorry about that. To this laboratory, uh, and basically prominent citizens, apprentices, anybody could come in and witness this. So you have these these naked women who are exposed with this horrible condition, and just anybody and their grandmother, pretty much, that were friends with Dr. Sims could come in and witness these operations being performed. Uh, so medical journals and professional word of mouth had detail that ether was an anesthesia that you could use as early as the 1840s. And he knew about it. It was very obvious that he knew about it. But he refused to administer this anesthesia to the slave women and girls. He claimed that this, these procedures that he was doing on them were not painful enough to justify the trouble and risk attending the administration. But this claim rings hollow because we found out later that when he did these, these same surgeries on white women, he always, always used anesthesia. But on these women that he was perfecting it on, he refused to use uh, anesthesia, even though it was available. Um, he announced that he had perfected this technique in May of 1849 after scores of operations over a period of five years on these uh, different women, including more than 30 on this one woman, Anne Monarca, who was the first person he did these experiments on. Uh, and in 1852, he wrote a paper on this repair and it was published in the prestigious American Journal of the Medical Sciences and he gained this huge reputation nationally and became known as the father of what would eventually be called gynecology. So he became this, this huge expert uh, and gained fame and fortune as a result of five years worth of, of treating supposedly these slave women who had this condition. Uh, one of his colleagues that worked right alongside him uh, insisted that not half of the women he treated uh, were afforded relief by the painful surgeries, even though he tried to say otherwise. Uh, his, his colleague, who he eventually uh, pretty much talked about as if he was the worst person in the world when he heard that he said these words, uh, but he was being honest and said that you know, he didn't really help these women. He wasn't trying to help these women. He was trying to perfect the technique, and whether it worked on these women was really irrelevant. He just wanted to get the procedure down so that he could begin doing it on white women. So let's look at some more up-to-date experiments uh, that took place in the 20th century. And this is a, a quote from a neurosurgeon, uh, Harry Bailey. And uh, he's at a medical conference at Tulane University, speaking during the conference. So there's all of these doctors from around the country that are here, and he has the nerve to say this. He said it was cheaper, and this is the exact words he said. It was cheaper to use niggers than cats because they were everywhere, and cheap experimental animals. Imagine that, you're at a national medical conference, not in 1845, 1960, and you have the nerve to say this, and there's no negative repercussions because of you saying these things. So these are some of the gentlemen that were involved in the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, as they called it. And we're going to talk in more detail. We're also going to see a couple of videos, uh, one video that talks about this as well. So this was how the New York Times announced uh, this when it finally came out, when word finally came out about these experiments, they said the syphilis victims in U.S. study went untreated for 40 years, and they go on to detail exactly what happened. So they started this, this study, which they called, the U.S. Public Health Service called the Tuskegee Study of Syphilis and the Untreated Negro Male. Now they specifically chose uh, these individuals in this particular county in Alabama because they had one of the highest rates of syphilis in the country. And so they were interested in seeing what would happen to the male's body if they had syphilis and it went untreated over a period of time and went through the different stages. What would actually happen to the body? So between 1932 and 1972, 600 black men, their wives and their children were deceived into participating in the study uh, that denied them treatment so that the public health service scientists could trace the progress of the disease in blacks. Now, let's think of this. This is 40 years. 40 years, which means a variety of different doctors and other medical professionals took part in this. It wasn't a secret. It was something that was a huge deal within uh, the public health services uh, venue. They did this 
And they said, okay, let's evaluate it. Okay, let's continue it. Let's evaluate it. Let's continue it. Let's evaluate it. Let's continue it. And they did this over and over and over and over again for 40 years. And in fact, they didn't just stop because, oh, we were done. They stopped because somebody wrote about them. And it became a huge story. And they were shamed into stopping this study. Talk about Tuskegee, the Tuskegee experiment, though you write about how it obscures all others. A lot of people don't even know about Tuskegee. That's true, that's true. Um, Tuskegee is the, you know, the icon of abuse of experimentation of black people, but it's true, many people still don't know what happened. And there are a lot of misconceptions floating about as well, so that's a really good question. I mean, um, what happened was that about 400 black men in Macon County, Alabama, with syphilis, who had been diagnosed with syphilis at least, were studied over a period of 40 years by the United States Public Health Service. There were 200 men who were not infected, who were held as a control group, also black men. Over the course of 40 years, these men were duped into thinking that they were in a treatment program but they weren't. They were given pink pills, which, as it transpired, were simply aspirin. They were given spinal taps, which, as it transpired, were not for the good of their health or to monitor their health, but rather to um, ensure a supply of Sarah for the development of a syphilis test. So they were used over 40 years, even after the advent of penicillin. When penicillin was recognized as a cure, it was withheld from these men. And this was between what, uh, what, what was a 40-year span? 1932 to 1972. How many people knew about this at the time? How did it stop? Hundreds of people knew about it because there were regular reports in the medical journals and it was actually presented at an American Medical Association meeting in 1965. There were also numerous meetings of governmental agencies where they periodically would ask, should we continue the experiment or not? And the decision was always yes. We should continue the experiment. It's worth noting that the Surgeon General, Thomas Perrin, had taken on syphilis eradication as his mission. And yet, when penicillin was devised and he had the cure, he made the decision to continue the experiment because he said, they represent an opportunity that will never come again. What happened to the untreated men? Uh, the untreated men, as you can well imagine, um, many of them died horrible deaths. You know, they were not only infected with syphilis that was untreated, but these were also very poor men, sharecroppers. Uh, their median income was a dollar a day, but being sharecroppers, they rarely saw any money. And um, they were debilitated beyond their years by syphilis and the frustrating labor. And um, so many of them died, you know, very bad deaths from syphilis. They suffered, the secondary stage of syphilis is very um, painful. It constitutes running sores you know, heart abnormalities, and the last stage of syphilis is devastating, neurologically devastating. Not everyone progresses to the last stage, you know, fortunately. But you can't predict who will and who won't, so everyone should be treated. Now, this 40-year period obviously spanned both Democratic and Republican administrations uh, in charge of the United States Public Health Service. Did your research un uncover anybody who actually uh, raised alarm and, and, and questioned, I mean, not just asked to continue it, but actually tried to oppose uh, a call for an end to this experimentation. Two people. One was Dr. Irvin Schatz of Detroit, who wrote a letter to the Public Health Service after they published an article in a premier medical journal. And he said, I'm shocked and astonished that you are permitting these men to continue um, um, dying of a treatable disease. And there is a note attached to his letter by a physician who writes, I'm not going to answer this. And indeed, they didn't. The other person was Peter Buxton, and he was a young Polish immigrant who was responsible for ending the study because he was a low-level interviewer with the Public Health Service, and he was shocked when he discovered it. He questioned it. Uh, at the risk of his job, he could easily have been dismissed even for questioning it. And um, what I found really chilling is the fact that he would write these letters, very brave of them, protesting it. And after he wrote enough of them, these doctors called him into a room where they all sort of sat arrayed against him, very intimidating, and lectured him, explaining to him the scientific process and why they were right to do this. Well, Buxton didn't agree. He left the PHS, went to law school, and through his entire four, three years of law school, kept writing these letters. And when he got no response, when they gave him the same silent treatment Dr. Schatz had gotten, he called a journalist friend. And 
the AP Ram story and the rest is history. And are there any of the doctors who are involved in these experiments who are still practicing? Uh, unfortunately, none of them, none of the doctors who conducted the experiment are alive. I say unfortunately because I think one of the great tragedies of the study is that the miscreants have gone unpunished. I say their names whenever I can because you never read of the names of people who were the architects of the study. It was Thomas Morrell, O.C. Wenger, these um, men and Thomas Perrin, others like them perpetuated the study and yet there's been, you know, no, they were never um, accused of anything, nothing castigated them. They apparently obviously have gotten off scot-free and blame has been deflected on a nurse, you know, who was uh, arguably the lowest person on the medical totem pole. And she's been made, um, Eunice Rivers has been made to bear the brunt of this study when actually the people who devised it were never challenged. And so if you guys see on that list of resources, one of the books I have is uh, called Bad Blood, and it's a very detailed analysis of the uh, Tuskegee uh, experiment. Uh, so here, here's one of the people who was involved in this, uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas Morell of the Public Health Service. He said, the future of the Negro lies more in the research laboratory than in the schools. With disease, he should be registered and forced to take treatment before he offers his diseased mind and body on the altar of academic and professional education. So he said that blacks were more valuable as recipients of these types of experiments than as medical professionals themselves. So let's look in a little more detail at the study. There were 399 men who actually had syphilis, 201 without who were the control group, and they would be given periodic physical assessments and told they were being treated. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Moden, who uh, was a leader of Tuskegee, um, you know, Tuskegee is, is this place that, that has this great amount of lore within uh, the history of blacks in the country. Uh, and, and Booker T. Washington ran Tuskegee. He created what was known as the Tuskegee machine. And when he died, uh, his assistant, who had been by his side for many years, Robert Moden, uh, ran the university. And he agreed to support the study if the Tuskegee Institute gets its full share of the credit and if black professionals were involved. So there was a doctor and then Nurse Rivers, which uh, Ms. Washington just talked about, uh, were involved. And so they were complicit in this as well. 1936, a major paper was published about the study, uh, criticizing it because it's not known if the men are being treated. Local physicians asked to assist with the study and not to treat men. Decision was made to follow the men until they died. So it initially said, we're gonna just follow them for a short period of time. Then it said, well, you know what, let's follow them until the day that they just drop dead and we'll see exactly what happens to them. 1945, penicillin was accepted as a treatment of choice for syphilis. So here you have 13 years after they start this, there's a treatment for syphilis which they could have given each and every one of these individuals, but they chose not to. Uh, by 1968, concern was raised about the ethics of the study by Peter Buxton and some others. CDC reaffirmed the need for the study and gained local medical society support. So here we have a person who challenges these and says something is wrong and the Centers for Disease and so it's, no, it's, it's okay, we can, we can continue. There's, there's not really an issue. You had a comment or question? I had a question. Yes. Um, I've heard of this before. Were they healthy men that were injected with syphilis? No. Or did they have? That's them? that's part of kind of the mythology about Tuskegee that's out there. People say that they injected them with syphilis. They actually found men who already had syphilis. They just didn't give them treatment for it. So there were 399 men who actually had syphilis. They contracted it and they went untreated for you know a long period of time. So in 1972, the first news articles condemned, condemned the study, uh, and the study eventually ended in 1972 as a result of all this bad publicity, including the New York Times article that you guys saw earlier. All right, there's another um, great book which is on the list called Acres of Skin, which talks about experiments in Holmesburg Prison in Pennsylvania. Uh, and so they basically abused these human subjects at the prison um, outside of Philadelphia from 1951 all the way through 1974. And there were a variety of agencies involved in this. University of Pennsylvania and its medical college, um, big dermatologists uh, including Albert Klegman, uh, every big pharmaceutical company in the country, the FDA was involved in it, 
the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, the Army, and the CIA were all involved in these experiments on these people that were held in Holmesburg Prison. Uh, and so the book, Acres of Skin, does a tremendous job talking about those experiments. Welcome to Pennsylvania Inside Out. From 1951 until 1974, hundreds of Philadelphia prisoners were used as human guinea pigs in an array of unethical and oftentimes dangerous medical experiments. The experiments left many test subjects, most of whom were African Americans, in excruciating pain and with long-term health problems. Our guests are Alan Hornblum, author of Sentence to Science, One Black Man's Story of Imprisonment in America. He's the first person to shine a light on this dark chapter in American medical history. Also with us is Eddie Anthony, now known as Yusuf Anthony. His story is the focus of Hornblum's book, which is published by Penn State Press. Thank you both so much for joining us. Good to be with you. So I started working in the Philadelphia prisons, and it was on my initial tours through the complex of prisons in Philly that I saw scores of men wearing adhesive tape and bandages and all sorts of wraps around their heads and backs and arms and I couldn't imagine the prison was that safe. You know, were these, you know, knife fights on a cell block or a gang war in the prison yard? And the next day I asked the guard on the cell block, what's with all these guys that were strapped and wrapped in adhesive tape and bandages? He says, oh, that's nothing. That's just the perfume test for the University of Pennsylvania. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, they're, they're doing uh, perfume experiments. Experiments have been going on, medical experiments, serious invasive procedures, for 20 years before I ever got there. And not just cosmetics and perfumes. Absolutely. I thought that was in the minority if there was any perfume. They, they were doing uh, just anything you can imagine from the innocuous to the truly dangerous. Now, was this an anomaly in, in Holmesburg prison, or is this something that's gone on in other prisons across the country? It was widespread in the Cold War years in America. Uh, from the end of the Second World War to the mid-70s, at least half the states had one prison that were hosting prison medical experiments. There were folks in the pharmaceutical community and the medical community who wanted to do clinical trials. The University of Pennsylvania is a big research operation, so it was convenient to them and everybody if they could find cheap and available test subjects, and that's what the prison system afforded them. The inmates themselves were desperate to make money, was it money that lured you to do your first test? Yes, it was money and um, the fact that I didn't have people coming up and visit me at the time to put money on the books for me so I could go to the commissary at the store. And uh, also they was using it to uh, get bail money if you had low bail. Could possibly get out on bail by participating in the test. Tell us about your first test. Um, they signed me to a uh, Johnson & Johnson bubble bath test. And uh, I went over there and uh, if you ever seen the cover of uh, acres of skin, they have a guy sitting on the table with patches on his back. Well, they put six patches on my back of a bubble bath, but it was the solution they sprayed on my back to seal the pores on my back so that the tape would stick on, so that my back wouldn't sweat, and it was very toxic. That got into my bloodstream, and it poisoned me, and I'm still suffering from that particular uh, test right now today. My hands and stuff broke out. You know, they was like, uh, my f one finger was the size of two fingers, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, my fingernails was growing like claws. And in fact, before my hands and feet broke out, my whole body was inflamed after the uh, poison got into my system. It wasn't just the University of Pennsylvania Medical School involved in this. Uh, it was also the Army and the CIA. There was military testing going on as well. If you were in the business of testing products or wanting to put a product on the market, you knew about Dr. Kligman, University of Pennsylvania, and Holmesburg Prison. They were infamous, notorious in the field of human experimentation. Point. One of the hallmarks of the Nuremberg medical trials uh, from 1933 to 1945, Nazi doctors used concentration camps right. in much the way as the Holmesburg, Holmesburg prisons were used, uh, was a, a, a code of ethics. And, and one of the codes is informed consent. First prison. Right. One of the very sad chapters of American medical uh, history in the 20th century is that we tried the Nazi doctors, we harangued them, we told them what proper research medicine is like, we executed seven of them, then we write this excellent code of ten principles, but we never bought into it ourselves. They gave you a, a simple piece of paper that read like, uh, if something was to happen to you after the test, you can't hold the University of Pennsylvania responsible. So right there, you would automatically question it. I thought they were safe. 
They say, they tell you, this is just a formality. Just, you know, you just have to have your signature to make it believe that it was, you know, everything was all right. But after they got you over there, and if you got sick, then they have no aftercare in place or nothing, you know? Like, I, this happened to me in 1964, and here it is, uh, 2007, I'm still suffering from it. And so the gentlemen that were involved in these tests in Holmesburg Prison, uh, with the assistance of Mr. Hornblum, who wrote the book Acres of Skin, uh, they tried to sue, and they were unsuccessful uh, in their lawsuit. Um, but there are also other experiments. This particular one was experiments on black boys. Uh, and so this was an article which talked about it and says that federal research ethics officials are investigating several psychiatric experiments in which 100 New York City boys, many of them black or Hispanic, were given the now banned diet drug, Enfloramine. The three experiments took place at the New York State Psychiatric Institute, which is affiliated with Columbia University at Queens College. And so over a period of three years, ending in 1996, they did these experiments on 34 children, all of whom were six to 10 year old black or Hispanic boys, and they were given intravenous doses of this drug to test the theory that violent or criminal behavior may be predicted by levels of certain brain chemicals. So they made the assumption that these boys, since they were black and Hispanic, they were automatically predestined to be violent in some way. So they were testing to see whether or not you could make predictions about this. So it wasn't just men and women, there were children who were uh, devalued as well in these experiments. You also talk about experiments uh, or investigations done on, uh, on, on black adolescents who have behavior problems. So. Right, who are alleged to have behavior problems, yeah. And also on black boys specifically who um, they think um, might have a genetic predisposition to violence. There's no um, rationale for only looking at black boys. If you're looking at predisposition for violence, you should be looking at all boys. And most American boys, of course, are white. But it's black boys who've been singled out for these very dangerous experiments, such as a fenfluramine experiment that took place right here in New York City between 1992 and 1997. What was that about? Oh, they took, um, let's see from 110 to 36 black boys and gave them fenfluramine, which is half of that fenfen drug that was taken off the market because it was cardiotoxic, caused heart problems. They gave it to these boys in an attempt to see whether they would um, show some inclination toward violence. And they found the boys, because the boys were the younger brothers of children already in the juvenile justice system. So that was coercive in itself. They used the juvenile justice system to identify boys. And again, these, the protocol which I read only indicates black boys are eligible, white boys were not eligible. Mm. Ask you again about some of these experiments on children, there was a, a mis- All right, so we see that oftentimes young poor children are taken advantage of, they found these young students by the fact that they had a brother, an older brother, who had been caught up in the criminal justice system. And so in 1995, this scientist had these remarks about why they chose the people that they chose. We chose slum patients as radiation subjects because these persons don't have any money and they're black and they're poorly washed. Imagine that, that was in 1995 when he made that statement. And so you can see, once again, this is a perfect example of what I call the devaluation of black lives, uh, once again, in American history. Uh, how many of you guys have heard the story of Henrietta Lacks? Uh, just a powerful story. A uh, book about her is on the list of resources I gave you. The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. I'm not going to talk about her very much, but her story is just a fascinating story. Uh, she, she is a very special human being in the history of human beings. Uh, they were able to find these cancer cells from her body that were able to stay alive even after she died. And these cells, even though this woman died over 50 years ago, in 1951, she, she died of cervical cancer. Those cells from her body are still being used in medical schools around the world. There's not a single person who is a doctor anywhere on the planet Earth that's gone to a medical school that has not used some of those cells, they call HeLa cells, from this woman's body. 
They took them without her permission, without her authority, without her family knowing about it, and they've been selling these, replicate, they replicate themselves. So they, 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 there are literally trillions and trillions of these cells still alive, continuing to grow way after this woman died, and they're called the HeLa cell line. So they've been used extensively in medical research since she passed away. Um, she was only 31 when she died of cervical cancer in a Baltimore hospital. And, and not long before she died, they removed some of the tumor cells from her body and they discovered that, that the cells were still living, that they were able to replicate themselves. And so soon these cells, which are known as HeLa cells, are being shipped from Baltimore around the world. In the 62 years since, uh, which is twice as long as she lived, her cells have been the subject of more than 74,000 studies around the world. Imagine that, more than 74,000 studies, and they've yielded profound insights into cell biology, vaccines, in vitro fertilization, cancer, any major disease that you can think of, uh, they've used her cells in response to trying to find cures for those diseases, HIV uh, and AIDS, uh, a multitude of different types of cancers, hepatitis, every major disease you can think of that they're trying to find cures for, they've used her uh, HeLa cells to try to find cures for that. Uh, how many guys have heard of Mr. Eb Cade? He's talked about in uh, medical apartheid. Uh, this was a, a, a young man, I can call him young because he was about my age when this happened to him, a little bit older than me. And he worked at this place, uh, West Oak Ridge, uh, and, and he worked at this as a cement mixer at this weapons production plant in Tennessee. Uh, and one day, he actually got into an accident on his way to work and he was injured, had a couple fractures, but nothing really, really serious. Uh, but he went into the hospital and over the next several weeks, he was kept in the hospital and injected with plutonium. He had no idea they were injecting plutonium into his body. They did it secretively. And he was wondering why he was, you know, in the hospital for such a long time for such minor injuries. But it turned out he was just the first of 18 people that they injected in this uh, federally sponsored uh, experiment to test the toxicity of plutonium on people to see, you know, how long does it take to kill you? Does it make you ill? Such and so on and so forth. And so he was in the hospital wondering, you know, what's going on? Why am I still in the hospital? Uh, they waited until 20 days after the crash to set his broken bones. So they were too busy injecting him with plutonium to actually treat his, his, his broken bones that he uh, suffered in the car accident. And uh, samples were taken from his bones for a biopsy. And they also pulled 15 of his teeth out of his mouth to analyze. Uh, so eventually, uh, his limbs healed and he snuck out of the hospital. They could never find him again. Uh, and eventually he died a couple years later of heart failure. So here is this man who just, on his way to work, gets into a car accident, and for weeks on end, he's treated like a piece of meat, literally. And so this is another perfect example of the devaluation of blacks by the medical profession. They didn't care about his wounds. You see they waited almost three weeks to treat his wounds. And they just wanted to see what the plutonium would do to his body. Excuse but, me. excuse me. Yes. What does it, in one of the previous slides, did it say the year that he had the auto accident? Yes. I'll wait for you to go back. Sorry. It's okay. So 1953, he died. Okay. Uh, so this accident happened in 1945. 1945. Okay. But he wasn't the only person. So the U.S. government targeted other blacks for experimentation in the 1950s. Uh, early in that decade, CIA, U.S. military, uh, released close to half a million mosquitoes infected with yellow fever and dang fever in the several black neighborhoods in Florida. So they, they took this airplane that they put these mosquitoes into and they flew over this black section of town and they released all of these diseased mosquitoes. So dozens of people in the community uh, became ill and at least eight residents actually died from being infected by these mosquitoes. So here you have the government 
flying a plane with infected mosquitoes over a community on purpose, letting the mosquitoes out, and the mosquitoes bite all of these different people, and eight people end up dying. And of course, the government denied it, and it wasn't until many, many, many years later that through the Freedom of Information Act that people found out about this experiment that was done. So here you have these people just living their lives as normal, living in Florida. Of course, they're mosquitoes, but not like two million mosquitoes at one time. And all of a sudden, you're swarmed by these mosquitoes, and, and then people start to die from it. So this is another example of the devaluation of black lives in America. Uh, there's this other phenomenon, which is, is, is very strange indeed. There's been this fascination with the black body uh, for a number of years. Uh, and so one of the things that people used to do, they used to put black people on display probably the most famous person who was put on display was a woman that was known as the hot and tot Venus. She was from South Africa and she was sold to a person who decided to begin to display her. Now her name is Sarki Bartman. Sarki Bartman, that's how you pronounce her name. Uh, she was a slave of a Dutch farmer uh, and Alexander Dunlop, a military surgeon, uh, who had a side show that he used to run with different animal species, suggested that uh, Sarki travel with him to London, entertaining people because of her exotic origin by showing what they thought of as highly unusual body features. She had very large buttocks and also the elongated labia of some coitian women. And so this was one of the the, the bills that they posted to announce that she would be there and you'd be able to come and witness this woman. So there's a, 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 a film that was done about her life. I'm going to show you guys a little piece of that. She's astonishingly different. She is a phenomenon of the African woman. She is the modern Tortillas. a truly remarkable phenomenon. A female savage from the dark continent, Africa. I am Hendrik Cesar, and I captured her in the forest where she roamed freely among her people with the express purpose of bringing her here to show you. Let me not keep you waiting a moment longer. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the heart and top Venus! I am one of the few white men on the African continent that speak her tongue. I have just asked her to stand up. <laughs>
I pray you, leave the theater now. Quietly. So he eventually took her out of this cage that he had her in, and she traveled around Europe uh, as this animal species from South Africa. Uh, and eventually, um, she visited Ireland. She was sold to a Frenchman uh, who took her to France and uh, in September of 1814. There's this animal trainer who exhibited her under more pressure conditions for all, a little over a year. Um, she refused payment to allow scientists to observe her genitalia. These scientists were willing to pay huge amounts of money to look at her genitalia. And so she refused to allow them to do that in the spring of 1815. She died in December of that year uh, due to this unknown condition. They're not really sure how she died, but one of the interesting things that happens, and it's talked about in one of the books that's on the list, Hot and Top Venus, they actually cut her vagina out of her body and put it in a jar, and it traveled around the world for people to see it to look at it and, and, and write papers about it and things of that nature. Uh, and so they kept her body uh, for many, many years, her skeleton and her, her genitals were preserved, her brain were placed on display uh, in different places around the country up until 1974 when they were removed from public view and stored out of sight. Uh, a cast of her body was still shown up until 1976. So after the ANC uh, defeated apartheid uh, in Africa and Nelson Mandela became president, they formally requested that France return uh, her remains to her native country. And so they agreed to do that. Uh, and in August of 2002, over 200 years after she was born, her remains came back home. And so this is just a sideshow, another example like I say, another classic example of the devaluation of the lives of black people. But she was not the only case of a person who was treated in this way. This is a group of blacks who were on display at the 1904 St. Louis World's, World's Fair. Now, they were treated like animals. They were placed in a cage with monkeys. And people came along, and they were able to see them in the cage and got good laughs out of it, took pictures. One of the individuals in this picture became very famous, uh, not because he was somebody special, but because he was a person that they continued to put on display uh, years later. Uh, and this is him here, and we'll talk about him shortly. But this is one of the things that they said about these people. The Negro with us is not an actual physical being of flesh and bones and blood, but a hideous monster of the mind, ugly beyond all physical portraying, so utterly and infallibly monstrous as to frighten reason from its throne and justice from its balance. So here we have an example of black people being put in a cage with monkeys on display for whites to come from far and wide to witness these individuals. The young man I talked about who was in that picture, Oda Benga, was 23 years old, was from um, Southern Africa, which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And in 1903, he returned from a hunting trip and he found the village that he lived in was, was, was on fire, up in flames. And so his, his family was gone, his wife and his children, everybody uh, in his family had been uh, slaughtered by the military there which was supported by the Belgian government. Uh, he was seized and he was sold and he was put on display at the Bronx Zoo in 1906 and there were only five promotional photos taken of him uh, but none of them were allowed to be taken while he was inside the monkey house. They felt that that was too inflammatory. So uh, displays of non-white humans as examples of earlier stages of human evolution were common in the early 20th century. World fairs, you would see uh, demonstrations of blacks on display, uh, Native Americans on display, different Asian people on display, uh, Pacific Islanders from different places on display, a variety of different people from Africa on display. Uh, African American newspapers, of course, they strongly opposed the treatment of Mr. Benga and eventually that led to his release. Uh, but the outbreak of World War I stopped ships from traveling across the Atlantic Ocean as passenger ships. And so he never had the opportunity to return to Africa. He became very uh, depressed and at the age of 32 he killed himself. 
so that's a very sad story of Oda Binga. Uh, so let's look now, uh, shifting gears a little bit, let's look at research in psychology. And we'll see that there were disparities and there was definitely a level of blacks being mistreated and devalued in this history as well. There were several scientific justifications for devaluing black lives during the 1840s and 1850s when people needed to find a new justification for enslaving Africans because the old ones didn't work anymore. So what happened, the American School of Ethnology was developed and they used what they call scientific data to prove that the races of mankind had been, been created as separate, distinct, unequal species. And Dr. Samuel Morton led this movement with this book that he wrote called Crania Americana. In addition to that, Dr. Josiah Knott worked to prove that blacks were not blood brothers of whites, and he considered mulattoes, that's a person who has one white parent, one black parent, he considered them to be a hybrid that was weaker and less fertile than either parent stock. In fact, many people consider mulattoes to be infertile. They said that these mulattoes would eventually die out because they are infertile, they cannot have children. And the, the term, the name mulatto, comes from the name of a mule. A mule is actually infertile. It's, it's, it's the progeny of a horse and a donkey. So it can't have, can't have any, any children. And they felt that these mulattoes were exactly the same or very similar. And they felt that they either had a, a lower rate of fertility or no ability to have children at all. Uh, Louis Agassiz was another uh, important individual in the scientific racism. He was from Switzerland and he began teaching at Harvard uh, a couple years after he arrived in the United States. And he maintained that the races constituted distinct species of genus Homo and not varieties of the same species. So he felt that blacks and whites were not even of the same species. So these guys got together and they used tools of comparative anatomy to attempt to prove the innate mental and physical superiority of the white race. They did experiments on blacks, they did experiments on Native Americans, uh, they measured every part of the body that you can imagine. They measured brains, they measured the inside of the skull cavity, they measured hearts, they measured private parts, they measured noses, they measured everything, literally everything you can imagine was measured and compared and used to prove that the superior uh, species on board the planet Earth would be white people. So there was racism in uh, the study of psychology as well. We don't typically think of psychology, uh, you know, we, we, we take psychology classes perhaps, and we learn about some of the, the giants in, in psychology, uh, but we don't realize that there were some issues within how this was done. One of the issues, and this is one of the books that's on the list, uh, even the rap was white, and it talks about kind of the history of psychology uh, from the black perspective. Uh, a black psychologist actually wrote the book. Uh, and as early as 1897, researchers were using intelligence tests to analyze racial differences uh, in the United States. Because they wanted to compare, once again, they, they were looking at the bodies for many, many years. They said, okay, now let's begin to look at the intellect. You know, we've already made these comparisons of the bodies, and we found that whites are superior based on those observations. So let's make some further observations and look at intelligence. And they, they began to use these intelligence tests that were developed at this time. So there was a specific test in Washington, D.C. in 1897 where they had these students read four stanzas of poetry and they compared these white students to these black students. And to their surprise, the black students did better than the white students. So they automatically said, well, since the black kids did better than the white kids, it absolutely proves that using memory is not a valid measure of intelligence. Now, if the results would have been the other way, they said it would have been a valid measure of intelligence. But since the black kids did better, which surprised the mess out of these people, they said, well, we, we, we're not going to try that again, because that's not working. We didn't get the results that we thought we would get. And so they decided to not do that anymore. Uh, they developed IQ test, and uh, this guy by the name of Binet uh, developed this IQ scale. And they began to use this to compare blacks and whites for the first time in the United States in 1912 in South Carolina, they began to give people these very biased uh, IQ tests. And obviously, depending on how you scored, 
determine whether or not you were on one of these particular scales. Now, this scale was developed many, many years later. Uh, Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale is a scale that we currently use. And, you know, I'm a special education teacher, so I'm always working with our school psychologists, and they, they do these IQ tests on our students on a regular basis, uh, or students who are being tested to see if they're eligible for special education, and they do these tests. And I've seen the tests, and, and the tests are absolutely just ridiculously stupid. They're just idiotic. I, I don't see how they can use those questions to determine. You sit down for 45 minutes, and this test result determines the direction of your life for the rest of your life. So here you are, a 10, 11, 12 year old kid, they give you a 45 minute test, and this test determines what your so-called IQ is, and a lot of the students are in this range, 70 to 79, and oh, well, you are mentally retarded. And so you put on a certain track for the rest of your time you're in school. So there was a graduate student named Alice Strong. When she did this experiment in Columbia, South Carolina, she divided uh, the, the whites from the blacks. But then she said, I'm going to divide the blacks into separate groups. So I have the dark-skinned ones, the medium complexion ones, and the light-skinned ones. And so the reason that she did that, she wanted to determine if there was an effect of white blood that they had in their bodies on intelligence. So she wanted to see if the ones who had lighter skin had higher IQ scores than the ones with darker skins because she felt that, well, that white blood in their body would trickle into their intelligence level. And so they would probably be more intelligent because of the white blood that was in their body. And her results proved to be absolutely what she was looking for. How convenient. Yeah, how convenient. So the results of these culturally biased IQ tests uh, were used to justify segregated schools. People were arguing, saying, well, you know, people should be able to go to school together, and they used the results of these tests to justify maintaining segregated schools. The Army uh, in World War I used uh, two different tests. One was called the Alpha Test, one was called the Beta Test, used to test soldiers as they came into the military. And they used the test results, for the blacks at least, to justify putting in manual labor details. Now. Whether they had these test results or not, they were gonna put them in the manual labor details either way. But they said, okay, well, we have a reason to do it now. Nobody can argue and say, well, they shouldn't be in these details because here we have proof that they're less intelligent, therefore, they should be in these labor details. And so for many of them, their test scores are very low. In addition to the blocks that were tested, though, one of the, 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 the kind of hidden parts of our history is that a lot of, of uh, European immigrants from the southern and eastern part of Europe who had come over were given these IQ tests as well. So imagine someone who is just barely learning English and they're given these tests. How do you think they're going to score? They're not going to score very well. And so what they did is they used those test scores of these European immigrants who came over from southern and eastern Europe and they used those to justify creating a law in 1924 which cut off immigration from southern and eastern Europe completely. They said, we don't mind white people coming to the country. But we don't want the white people from this part of the world coming to the country. So what they did, they were very clever with it. They used the 1920 census data to determine how many people from different places in Europe were in the country. So they may have been, say, 2% of the, the immigrants that came over were from Greece, or 3% were from Russia, or wherever. And so they used those numbers in this 1924 law. They said, we're going to use those percentages to determine the percentage that we will allow into the country moving forward. So if there was 1% that was from Greece, 1% of the people allowed from Europe will be Greece, and so on and so forth. But what they recognized very quickly after they passed this law, they said, well, you know what? From 1880 to 1920, it was literally millions and millions and millions of these people that came over. So the number's are a little bit too high. So they backtracked to the 1880 census, to the percentages of them that were here in the country at that time, and they instead used those numbers to determine the immigration status of people that would be allowed into the country. And that law stayed in effect until 1965, before it was finally changed. So this is one of those times where unintended consequences of a law that was designed to hurt a particular group of people ended up hurting some white folks as well. Another classic example of people who, you know, were innocent bystanders. But, you know what? We don't mind white folks coming. 
but they got to be a certain type of white folks, they said. So people from northern and western Europe were welcomed into the country in large numbers. Because if you think about it, those were the people who came over initially. Uh, people from southern and eastern Europe, the Italians, the Greeks, uh, people from Russia, Armenia, things of that nature, they came over many years later and they weren't welcomed into the country. There was this very uh, large push to keep America 100% pure. And they considered these people to be impure white people. They didn't want them to come into the country. So in addition to blacks being hurt by these intelligence tests, whites were as well. So they expanded these tests after the war ended. The army stopped doing the test, and the universities became the new testing ground. And the testing, and this is what's wrong with the test. The tests were normalized only on white people. So it basically meant that everybody else had to live up to the exact same standard as whites. And if you didn't, then something was wrong with you. Because this is the standard bearer. Whites will be the standard bearer by which all groups will be measured moving forward. So there was this idea of Eurocentric psychology. The science of psychology was developed from a white middle class perspective which required generalizing their results to all of humanity. So when we study these middle class whites and the way that they live their lives and the way their, the psychology of their brains work, well everybody should have the same things. Everybody should think the way they think, should act the way they act. Everybody, regardless of where you're from. Everybody on the planet should reflect the same things we're seeing in this particular group of people. So poor whites didn't fit in because they didn't fit the middle class values. They had a different set of values. Somebody from some little island in the Pacific Ocean, they were supposed to live up to these standards, but obviously they didn't. They're from a completely different background. And so a majority of the world's population did not fit into these standards. Yet they were used as a standards to compare everybody on the planet. So psychology rested on this concept of mastery of nature and control of people. Concepts which are in stark contrast with the cosmology of people outside of Europe. If you look at the way people historically in most places on the planet Earth outside of Europe have looked at the world, the Native Americans, the way they look at the world, the way most people in Africa look at the world, they have not developed this sense of wanting to control mother nature. The Europeans did, and it was part of the way they treated psychology was like, we want to be able to not only control things, we want to be able to predict what's going to happen later. And this was a completely foreign concept to people outside of Europe. So these psychologists developed this mindset and used it as they created these different tasks. And so the primary task of psychology is to assess different traits and abilities, compare people based on these traits and differences using IQ tests to seal the fate of individuals before they become adults. So you have young children who come into the country from Central America, from Mexico, from Guatemala, El Salvador, all these different places that don't speak English. English is their second language. And so they are expected to live up to the exact same standards as somebody that's been speaking English their entire lives. It's not going to happen. Now, if you test them in their native language, you will see it's not an issue. But if you're testing them in English as we do, forcing them to learn English as we do, then obviously they're going to have some issues. But we don't think about that because the standards are you should be at this level compared to middle class whites who almost all speak English. Okay? And so you have this big issue where young people are labeled at a very young age based on an IQ test and that determines the path they're on for the rest of their lives. They're placed in the special education and I can tell you I'm a special ed teacher, I've been a special ed teacher for six years and I can see the devastating impact it has on children. They are so embarrassed to have their classmates know that they're special needs. They don't want anybody to know. But obviously, when I come into the classroom and take them out of the classroom to go work with them in my room, everybody knows. Or when I come into the classroom, and those are the ones that I primarily work with, I work with all of the students in the classroom, but those are the ones I concentrate most of my efforts on, everybody knows. And it's hugely embarrassing to these children. Yes, ma'am? That's one of the huge issues that we have here in the But as you've been explaining, um, that the parents are convinced this is the best thing for your children. Because um, bilingual education is something that segregates our community. Walk into a racing school right now, it's very segregated. The Hispanics who speak Spanish are on this side, and the blacks and whites who all know English very well on that side. 
but they teach in Spanish to the kids that are born and raised here because their parents don't speak Spanish. It's an English sign. Absolutely. But they're taught, oh, it's the best thing for them. Absolutely. It's the best for everything. It's just, how, you know, this is interesting because it's repeating. What you said about the medical field, it's repeating. My own children didn't have anesthesia when um, we went to the dentist here in Racine, a prominent dentist. Gives its awards after awards. I, a physician here in Racine who passed away, got galactologists, you know, the, the doctors who deliver babies, wouldn't treat the Mexican women, didn't even know Mexican women had twins or triplets. Mm. Mexican women can have kids, they're tough, without anesthesia. They Absolutely. had Mexican interpreters. Mexican interpreters come in and tell the doctors, oh, they don't have any anesthesia. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that you're saying is happening here in the scene. Absolutely. Right now. And, and right now. Yes, yes, so you want to say something. In regard to the special ed kids, isn't it also a factor of how the other kids in the school react to them? And shouldn't you be working with the whole school community? And that, yeah, these kids are special needs. But they're just like you in, in a sense too. I, I taught in Burlington for 35 years and the school community there accepts those students mm -hmm. as part of the school community. Right. And maybe you need to work on getting the whole school, school community to, to, to respect them and to accept them as part of the whole school oh, community. Oh yeah, I absolutely agree. But this is kind of the, the way things have worked for special needs students. Uh, there was a law that was designed to protect these students. Because in previous years, the way special needs students were treated, they were taken out of regular schools and put in their own separate schools. And they, they were segregated. They never had any contact with their peers or their age group. And so people looked at that and they said, this is, this is unfair. So the Individuals with Disabilities Act was passed to protect them and put them back into the regular schools. But what happened once they got back, you mentioning people accepted and they weren't accepted. So what, what special ed teachers began to do is they began to take them out of their regular classroom, segregate them, work with them. And so now what schools are doing is they're saying, we're going to push them back into the regular classroom, where they call it inclusion. We're pushing all these students back into, now what they don't take into account is the fact that many of these students are two, three, four years behind academically. And so they can't keep up. They can't keep up with the pace. They have issues that prevent them from, from retaining information long term. So they struggle mightily, some of them. Not all of them, some of them do. And so part of kind of what I try to do, and I don't really have any control over because the administration uh, of the district kind of determines how we do our jobs to a certain extent without asking us any questions about it. I try to, to spend as much time giving those students what they need. We have to write for each of these students what's called an IEP, an Individualized Education program and within this program we're supposed to give them a certain amount of hours of service for math reading writing whatever give them that extra boost and we're supposed to do it now within the, the comforts of the regular classroom so if I'm in the regular classroom there's 35 students in there and there may be seven special needs students as I'm assisting the other teacher in the classroom everybody's asking for my help Everybody, not just the special needs students, everybody's like, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jackson. Everybody wants my assistance. Now, I can't just ignore those other students as well. I can't work with you because that's going to embarrass the special needs students. But I still have to concentrate most of my efforts on those special needs students. But what's happening now as a result of all of the testing that we're doing, we spend such a large amount of time outside of the classroom proctoring tests to special ed teachers that we don't have time to give the students the services that we're required to by law and they're really really hurting and nobody's really talking about the issue but I got to get back to this yeah. so let's look at a few other things some of the pioneers of Euro-American psychology Sigmund Freud we've all heard of Freud mm -hmm. he was the first psychologist to systematically examine personality development uh, he also generalized the psychology of Europeans in a particular era to the universal human condition. So everybody that he did his studies on were people from this Victorian Europe, very wealthy people for the most part. And of course, everybody had to live up to the standards of those people that he studied, which obviously was not going to happen. He described non-white people as having a primitive psychology. Carl Jung. 
create some of the best known psychological concepts, including the archetype, the collective and conscious, extroversion, introversion. He believed the childhood years had a monumental impact on our futures. And so this collective unconscious is part of the psyche that does not depend upon personal experience. It is the reservoir of primordial images inherited from our ancestral past. This was one of the things that he, that he talked about. So he was a racist though. There's a, a, a psychologist by the name of Frantz Fanon that used some of his principles, but he criticized them in this way. He said that, I believe it is necessary to become a child again in order to grasp certain psychic realities. This is where Jung was an innovator. He wanted to go back to the childhood of the world, but he made a remarkable mistake. He went back only to the childhood of Europe. So once again, generalizing the European experience for every single individual, and it just was not reality. Uh, in an article that he wrote called Your Negroid and Indian Behavior, Young deplored Americans' racial infection and the peculiarities of which whites, which he blamed on Indian and Negro influences. These consisted of whites acting childlike, high promiscuity, exhibitionism, and having Negroid mannerisms. He said that blacks and Indians were infecting whites with these bad behaviors. Well, this, uh, is, this is the collective unconscious infecting. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, no wonder. All those people in the, in the New World are being infected. Absolutely. They're not European. They're not German. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something else. He said, now what is more contagious than to live side by side with a rather primitive people? Go to Africa and see what happens. The inferior man exercises a tremendous pull upon civilized beings who are forced to live with him. That's the end of this session. Our next session, Wednesday, will be our fourth session. We're gonna look at legal and extra-legal violence against blacks in American history. So we're gonna look at the history of lynchings, uh, the history of black women being raped during enslavement, the beatings that Africans took during enslavement, race riots against black communities such as Rosewood, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the history of police forces, uh, their complicity in the violence perpetuated by citizens and terror groups such as the Ku Klux Klan. We would look at the tradition of blacks being killed by law enforcement up to and including present day killings and disparities in the use of the death penalty will be examined as well. So that'll be our last session on Wednesday. Questions, please pass the cards up if you have any questions and I will do my best to answer them. Thank you. Okay. All right. Yes, thank you. Okay, so let's look. Uh, it says, when my son entered Horlick High School, they had over 700 freshmen. When he graduated, less than 300 crossed the stage. If those 300, less than 10 were black, even fewer were Hispanic. What can be done in education to make these youths see they matter and have a future? This is one of the, the, the challenges that that I deal with on a daily basis as a teacher, there seems to be a much more pronounced um, attitude among children nowadays in terms of how they look at education. They don't value education the way that we did. However, I read something that was written way back in the early 1900s and, and, and it was a study done of, of, of young people and their attitudes toward the future. And it basically chastised young people for not valuing education, for not having the same values that their parents and their grandparents have. So they were saying this 100 years ago. And they were saying this 50 years ago. And they were saying this 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, 2 years ago. And they'll be saying it 10 years from now. So this is an issue that we deal with. I think what happens though, from my experience with, with young people, is that they, don't value the experience of school. They don't value sitting in a classroom, listening to teachers. They don't value what information we're giving them. They really don't value all of these stupid standardized tests they have to take. So to them, we as teachers, to a certain extent, look like hypocrites. Because we tell them that if you get your education, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah will happen to you. But they know people that have gotten their education that are in their families, that are in their neighborhoods, that finish high school, don't have a job, haven't had a job, don't have money, haven't had money, don't have a nice place to live in, don't have a nice car, don't have all these things that you're supposed to have if you just do the right thing and get your education. And the children are looking at this and they're saying, 
You lied to us. You're telling us if we just do this, then we'll have the world at our disposal, but their experiences of people that they see is telling them something completely different. So we have to have to be able to, to deal with what they what they see in their communities and express to them that look, and this is what I try to do with my students. I try to be as real with them as possible and say, look, the way our society is set up, the way our economy is nowadays in Milwaukee and Racine and many places that used to have a manufacturing base, those jobs are gone. They will never ever come back. So those experiences that the older people in your family, in your neighborhood had, where they were able to go to uh, Alice Chalmers or Aero Smith or one of these big companies and work for 30, 35, 40 years, perhaps, uh, Miller Brewing, all these places, get a nice pension, retire during the course of the time they work, they make good enough money to buy a nice home, a nice car, uh, you know, pass those. May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing promptly at 8 o'clock. If you have materials to check out or print jobs to pick up, please do so now. Internet terminals will shut down at 7.55. Thank you. Passing those things on to your children and grandchildren. These children do not see those opportunities for themselves. And so to them, the stuff that us old people are saying is just a bunch of nonsense. They don't respect it because it's not true for them. And so we have to be able to analyze the world from their perspective and let them know that, listen, opportunities are limited as compared to the experiences that we may have had. Those limited opportunities, if they, if they, they come to you, take advantage of them when you have a chance because you may not have a chance. I mean, when you look in Milwaukee at young black males, and, and, and it's, it's a critical time for young black males in Milwaukee, over 50% of the black males in Milwaukee are unemployed. We have 28,000 unlicensed drivers in Milwaukee County alone. People who can't drive a car legally. People who don't have jobs, and so their experiences their view of what the value of education is completely different. And we as adults, we haven't figured that out yet. We need to figure that out and recognize that we need to do something with education that's different from what we've been doing because it's just not working with these young, young people. Um, black disease, sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is not a black disease. Most people think that it is. Sickle cell anemia is, is a condition that people who lived in areas where malaria was very common, this was something that their bodies developed over the course of time to counteract malaria. And so what you find is when you look at people who have sickle cell, people who live along the Mediterranean Sea have sickle cell in very large numbers. The Africans from West Africa developed sickle cell because malaria was very, very common. Most people think of sickle cell as a black disease, but it absolutely has never been that. It's a condition that people have developed over the course of history to fight off malaria. Yes. Oh, so it wasn't really a question, but it is a question, and thank you for mm -hmm. informing. So several of my students over the last 15 years, I've had some mostly african-american so it's a descent because they're descendants of people who came from that area mm -hmm. possibly and um but wouldn't the converse be true that those diseases were not regarded as, or treated in this country as vigorously or the children maybe not helped because well, it was mostly absolutely people from those areas that absolutely and that, that's part of that devaluation okay. of blacks in the eyes of the medical community same thing with the AIDS virus wasn't okay. treated oh, because yeah. it was with the gay community right right, right. right. Okay. okay let's Thank uh you. oh you, you were going to say something else no uh, just that dr drew blood transfusions and i believe yeah. he dr. died or yes mm -hmm. he's one who yeah. discovered it and then I believe he died. Was it an auto accident or something? He couldn't died in get. A car accident. Mm -hmm. He couldn't get a transfusion. His whites and blacks were blood kept separate. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of very just strange things that happened. So you discussed the Tuskegee experiment, other medical testing on blacks done decades ago. Recently reported, um, uh, Agent Orange test on blacks Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, what we learned about other tests being done even more recently. Uh, now, one of the things, if you, if you read the book, Medical Apartheid, it, there's a ton of stuff in that book that I didn't cover. She talks about a lot of stuff that's going on nowadays. Um, and, and there are, in fact, 
uh, constantly coming up every six to, to, to 12 months you hear about new things that were done back in the day uh, in the 50s the 60s and 70s that were hidden from uh, most of America's but through the Freedom of Information Act people are finding out about these things in fact Harriet Washington said that the way that she found about the things that she talked about in her book was really doing very extensive research going back and reading old medical journals or diaries that doctors wrote and things of that nature trying to find access to files that the military had is very very difficult work and so it's very uh, difficult for, for investigative reporters to, to even find these things out because in so many cases they were kept secret and what ends up happening this is what usually happens the story is uncovered by some investigative reporter or someone who writes a book people talk about it for a couple weeks maybe a couple months and then they move on to something else it's not important anymore. And so what ends up happening, as you can see, she had enough of that information, she was able to write a very, very thick book about it. Um, isn't this a side of the demand of adequate medical care, a continuation of medical experimentation? Uh, you know, one of the things, and, and I didn't talk about it, uh, I didn't have time to talk about it in detail, uh, one of the things that, that's been discovered in terms of looking at medical care that people are provided is that typically, for instance, uh, uh, a family member of mine was just diagnosed as diabetic. Blacks who get diabetes are treated differently by, by doctors than whites who get diabetes. They don't get the same urgency of care they don't get the same uh, uh, quantity or quality of care and as a result blacks are way more likely than any other group in the country to lose a limb as a result of diabetes it isn't because diabetes works differently with blacks than it does with whites or because well, one of the things that a lot of people say well they don't take the medicine and they don't use a regimen and blah blah that's nonsense that's across the board people hate the regimen of diabetes they hate eating the right way they hate taking the medication regularly that's just across the board for everybody but as a result though many people that don't do the right thing their doctors say hey look listen you, you got to stay on this regimen you got to be serious about it blah 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 that's what they do to white people blacks they like well you know what you just not follow my instructions or nothing I can do for you and you end up six months later they lose a couple toes or they lose an entire leg I know several people in my family that have lost limbs literally due to diabetes and so there's a different level of care that people of color, not just blacks, but Hispanics, you know, there's a, there's a rising number of Hispanic people in the population that are being treated just as poorly uh, as any other group. And, and this is historical. This, one of the reasons I did this Do Black Lives Matter series, I wanted people to understand that this question that I ask, do black lives matter, is what you, we should be saying. We shouldn't be making the statement that black lives matter. We should be saying, do they really matter? Because I make this argument. If black lives really matter, we wouldn't know Trayvon Martin's name. We wouldn't know the name of Tamir Rice. We wouldn't know Eric Garner. We wouldn't know Rodney King. The reason we know those people's names, Michael Brown, Oscar Grant, the reason we know their names is because black lives have not mattered enough. And so that's the perspective that I have. I, I always tell people I try to look at things from a historical perspective because if you just look at it from the, 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 the now, you're missing too much. You're just seeing what's going on now and you're missing the fact that these things have been going on for the entire history of the United States of America and the impacts continue to build bigger and bigger and bigger and that's why uh, blacks live a shorter lifespan than whites do on average. Black men in particular live, I believe, seven years shorter lifespans than white men do. And so these are all parts of those, those reasons. And so what I want you guys to do uh, is fill out the evaluation if you'd like uh, and leave that with me. Uh, I'm hoping that you guys can come back on Wednesday. Uh, I think probably one of the more powerful pieces I'm going to be doing is a piece on uh, violence. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's you're going to hear some stories that I know that you've never heard before. I'm going to show you guys some videos that I know you've probably never seen before. Uh, and so it's going to be a very powerful uh, presentation, I believe. And it'll be the culmination of these, these four sessions. Uh, and I appreciate all of you that have come out uh, multiple times, especially, you know, it's, it's hard to get people out during the week. 
uh, especially on a day when it's 90 some degrees outside. <laughs> so I really do appreciate that. I appreciate the library for inviting me back time and time again. I always enjoy these presentations. Uh, and, and you know, I, there's a part of me that hates sharing all of this bad news with people, but there's another part of me that says we need to know the good and the bad because we need to be able to, to weigh things accurately. If we just look at the good and you know we ignore the bad stuff, we have to we have to give some weight to the horrific things that have happened in our history and 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 take ownership of them. We have to take ownership of these things as a nation and stop burying our heads in the sand and pretending that you know everything is so much better than it used to be. Well, in a lot of respects, they are, but we can do work to help make that happen. But we have to be aware. We have to have the knowledge base to do that. So. I'm trying to provide you guys with that knowledge base. So I appreciate you coming out. Check out the, the, the list gonna, of books. I think you're going to enjoy Check out your stuff or they're going to kick you out. Yeah. <laughs> well, they kicked me out before, so I'm used to it. Thank you guys so much.